Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington, and joining us again is Josh Stieber. He was a member of the Army Company that was an, in that famous WikiLeaks video in 2007. He wasn't there that day, but his comrades were. Thanks for joining us again, Josh. Sure, thanks for having me. So when we pick up from the last, you had more or less refused to stop firing your gun because you were being asked to fire at civilians. Uh, and so you got assigned to uh, be on uh, radio detail with one of the officers. So we'll talk about that and how does that lead you on your journey towards applying for conscientious objector status? I would be in meetings um, with the different officers and with uh, local officials. And um, one thing that was really huge for me um, was that uh, was one of the people that we met with regularly um, who was the mayor of, of the district that we were living in. And the interesting thing about that was um, how we established our relationship with him. We um, actually arrested him one night when we found out that he had been involved in some attacks against us. Um, and we were all set to send him off to jail until we found out that he was the mayor. So instead of sending him to jail, we started negotiating with him. And here I had been, you know, hearing all these things from uh, as high up as the president saying uh, we will not negotiate with terrorists and for me at the time that epitomized strength that you know I have the right answers why would I take the time to sit down and talk with somebody that disagrees with me and weakness was negotiation because if I'm right then I shouldn't need to depend on somebody else for help but I was seeing that my definition of strength was was hurting people and here was my definition of weakness of negotiating with people who were my enemies, starting to create some progress. Um, we would make deals and say things like, we'll give you school supplies or medical supplies if you tell your guys not to blow us up for a certain amount of time. And violence went down and supplies got distributed. And were these uh, Shia, Sunni, or did it make any difference? Um, I believe it was Shia, but I'm not 100% positive. So you, you don't know which, which insurgent, quote unquote, insurgent forces that, that he was connected to? We got very little training or information as far as, uh, as, far as the cultural situation went. To now what did you know about who you were fighting? We knew that, that the primary force in the area was the Jaysh al Mahdi under the control of Maktad al Sadr. So people recognized his name, but to pretty much get any kind of idea of what was going on culturally, you had to talk to the interpreters. Right, so these are Shia satirist forces which are mostly, if I understand correctly, a lot, mostly poor people. Yeah, yeah, it was a, a pretty impoverished part of town. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you start to hear, in, other than the negotiations, that starts to make you further question what's going on? For a while, I, I didn't know what definitions to have or, or didn't know what to think. And then I guess another very telling moment um, that really forced me to take all this confusion I had and really ask myself the difficult questions that I, I didn't want to ask was, um, one night, a friend of mine that I had gone to church with before we deployed, and, and again, religion play, it played a pretty important role in my life. So, um, so I'd gone to church with this guy, and we're sitting there one night guarding a prisoner um, that we'd been assigned, assigned to watch over. And my friend started saying some threatening things about what he wants to do to this prisoner. And again, I'd been sorting through all these different ideas of who I was as an American, as a Christian, all these different things. So I started to ask him, um, this ideal that I connected with my American identity that isn't this man innocent until he's proven guilty. And my friend said, um, echoing the racism that we're trained with, well, this man's Iraqi, there's no way he's completely innocent. Surely he's contributed to the problem in some way, so I want to take out my frustration on him. And then I started thinking about all the things that we had heard sitting next to each other in church and, and said, well, you know, what about um, these direct quotes from the man that supposedly our religion is founded on of loving your enemy and returning evil with good and, and turning the other cheek. And, um, and my friend said to me, uh, very sincerely I think, he said, you know, I think Jesus would have turned his cheek once or twice, but he wouldn't have let anybody punk him around. And as I heard him say that, it, it sounded really ridiculous, but then I thought about it a little further and I started to realize that what I was doing through my actions and the things I was putting my faith in was pretty much that exact same mindset. I just had a lot fancier um, terms to, to attach to it. And when I started to think about it and how bluntly my friend had put it, he was 
right that here I was saying um, that you know I was putting self-defense or putting national security um, at the top of my priority list which you know that can that's something you can legitimately debate but if you try and connect that to a man who died on a cross trying to practice love rather than defend himself and and, and not go through that you know horrible suffering that he did then those are two separate things and, and I don't think they have a whole lot of common ground so that really um, when I heard him say it that way it really started to make me think um, you know which one am I going to follow because I don't think it can be um, a, a combination. What about army chaplains or priests? I mean they're there they're actually there in a sense to bless the union of the nationalism and the religion or they wouldn't be there. Right. Yeah. I but mean, were you able to talk to them about these questions? I didn't see any value in talking to our chaplains because he you know would um, yeah say why God was blessing what we were doing um, and, and said some ridiculous stuff like that we should be interpreting everything that's going on or the, w the perspective we should have on on um, our experience in Iraq is think of it like summer camp and, and just stuff that he didn't seem to have much connection with what was going on. And, and at what point do you think back to that book, The Faith of George Bush, and start to wonder whether that's a faith you want to be part of? It's still a faith <laughs> that I guess I want to be part of, but not in, not in those terms. Um, again, that I feel like you know, George Bush might have felt like um, he was justified to do what he did you know the more I study the the um, harder that is for me to reconcile but giving him the benefit of the doubt even if I say that you know everything he said and did was completely justifiable in terms of national security still doesn't match up with you know the way that Jesus lived his life and so I can either choose to have faith in someone like George Bush or a political leader trying to you know, defend his country or whatever he's trying to do, or I can have faith that, you know, if it comes down to it, that sometimes practicing love might mean that you don't make it through a life and that I'd rather go down living with that love than go down um, and put in situations where, like this video, where you might be harming, you know, innocent children in the process. So do you write home? Do you talk on the phone to your parents? Your parents are quite religious. So how, how do you start to come out with your questioning? Yeah, I would start to, um, to write home uh, about the contradictions of the things that I saw or say that, you know, I think we need to look beyond just the flag and say that the flag or whatev whatever America puts its stamp of approval on, that, um, that doesn't necessarily make it good or even if it's good in terms of self-defense or whatever value that is that maybe that's not the same as carrying out our religion and how do your parents respond I mean Americanism is part of the religion yeah it didn't go over so well and kind of the um, the mindset it seemed that, that they would have or that other people I would talk to had and I didn't get very into the different details specifically of what was going on what I was seeing on a day-to-day -day basis it was more of the theories um, you know which I, I think sh should be enough, but um, the mindset that I would get from them and from other people was, oh, you know, you're in this really intense situation and, um, you know, you're not able to reconcile everything or, or maybe you should wait to try and figure out these huge philosophical questions and, and just do what it takes to, to make it home alive. Did the officers you were reporting to have any idea that what was going on inside your head there, uh, heart? They, they knew, I think, that I was starting to question things more and more and, and to feel um, less and less idealistic about the things that and were And how do you think they dealt with the same questions? Because um, they, they, they came up with a lot of the same kind of training and education you did, and why do you think this kind of made such an impact with you and they kept soldiering on? Like I said before, that, that they were questioning what we were doing, but it became about this mindset of um, fighting to make it home alive, um, which I'm not going to judge someone for taking that mindset, but you know, I had to ask myself some very serious questions, um, you know, of what's justifiable, um, and, and I think a lot of people think that uh, different things like human beings are naturally violent, or, or war is always going to exist, or, or these other very underlying philosophical beliefs that affect 
how they act and if you think that war is always going to exist um, or that you know you need to use violence to stand up for yourself you might you know even have problems with a, a particular situation um, but then justify it in terms that you know that this is just the way the world works or, or well in the next segment of our interview let's talk about the day you decided to apply for conscientious objector status please join us for the next segment of our interview with Josh Stieber on the Real News Network <laughs>